Hello, everyone, and welcome to The Jeffrey Epstein Show. I'm your host, Bobby Capucci, and this is Daily Drop number 166. Bradley Edwards, one of the lawyers for the survivors of Jeffrey Epstein, has a book coming out on March 31st, and the title of that book is Relentless Pursuit. So leading up to that book's release, he penned a few columns for the Daily Mail, and a couple of them dropped tonight. So we're going to read the first one of those columns directly from Bradley Edwards, a man who would know about the case, right? A man that has hands-on experience with the case, a man that's read the court documents, a man who has been on the front lines when it comes to the battle against Jeffrey Epstein and his estate. So we're going to read this article that he wrote for the Daily Mail as a lead up to his book coming out on March 31st called Relentless Pursuit. And obviously I highly suggest that everybody picks that up once it comes out. I just pre-ordered it myself on Audible and I can't wait to get my hands on it. So I'll be looking forward to read that, but until then, we have these teaser uh, articles that he penned for the Daily Mail, so we're going to jump into those and see just exactly what he had to say. The headline revealed, Prince Andrew's accuser Virginia Roberts fled Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell after they asked her to have their surrogate baby. Think about how chilling that is, how disturbing that is for this young girl. I mean, imagine being Virginia Roberts, 16, 17, 18 even, and these people are talking about you being the surrogate mother for their baby in their twisted genetics project. I mean, can you imagine what was going on through Virginia's head? Can you imagine what she was dealing with at the time? What she, what kind of nightmare she must have been living in? It's atrocious to even think about. For 11 years, top American lawyer Bradley Edwards made it his life's mission on behalf of countless young women, uh, women survivors, to put Jeffrey Epstein behind bars. Now, in a compelling new book entitled Relentless Pursuit, stories from which we are featuring over three weeks, he tells how he brought sociopath with unlimited wealth to justice. This is going to be awesome, folks. This is going to be very explosive stuff. I have a funny feeling that Bradley Edwards certainly knows what he's talking about, right? If anyone knows the ins and outs of the case, if anybody knows what's what, it's a guy like Bradley Edwards. And from everything we've learned about Bradley Edwards up until reading this, obviously, is that he's a fair shooter and he's been very fair and very um, good with the survivors and has always acted in an honorable manner. So I don't see why that would be changing now. And again, when people that are this close to the, the case come out and speak, I always say that we really should listen because we don't get enough of this candid talk from people who have had an inside look. It's hard. Everything's, you know, a scratch of the surface report or a report that doesn't really dive as deep as we need it to go. So when we hear from somebody like Bradley Edwards, or we hear from Virginia, obviously, or Annie Farmer or Maria Farmer, it goes a long way and it carries a lot of weight. Virginia Roberts was a striking 16-year-old with drive and a determination to improve herself. She was doing just that, reading a book on a bench one lunchtime outside Donald Trump's Mar-a-Lago Resort in Palm Beach, Florida. Her father, who worked at the club as a maintenance man, had helped her to get a job there in the summer of 1999 as a towel towel girl in the women's changing rooms. So imagine, she's working at Mar-a-Lago. Her dad gets her a job. It's all these rich people she's dealing with all the time, right? Up until this point, a bunch of rich people, they might have been weird, whatever it may be, but nobody was trying to assault her or anything like that. And you have this false sense of security when you're around affluent people. You don't think that they would ever risk going to jail or that they might be, you know, uh, devious or they might be corrupted. You don't think about that, right? Especially as a kid, you're like, well, they've attained all of this wealth. They must be good people. They're very rich. They hang out with affluent people, powerful people. They're friendly with them. And then they come into your changing room where, where you're working as a towel girl and they start talking with you, right? They start pie in the sky and you, promising you all kinds of things. And if you're from a background where you never had much growing up and your parents are scrambling to make ends meet all the time, 
it's it's very uh, tempting to take whatever's offered to uh, at the very least listen to what they have to say. And then you sit down with them, and we know that Ghislaine Maxwell was a professional at grooming these these girls. We know that she was a professional. What chance does a 16-year-old girl have who is being approached and groomed from the very minute she's approached, by the way? What chance does she have against somebody as devious as Ghislaine Maxwell, who was not only born for this, but she was bred for this sort of thing? Suddenly, the teenager was approached by a smartly dressed and rather charming woman. A British accent added to the sense of allure. And that goes back to what I was just talking about on my little uh, rant right there. You know, when somebody walks in and you're a kid from uh, a neighborhood or a home where you might not have all that much money and your parents are hardly home, they're always working, you might come from a one-parent home, whatever it may be, somebody shows up and they're dressed nice, they're speaking well, well, you automatically defer to them because you think that they're more successful than you or they've achieved more or that they're a higher rung of society than you are. And we all know that that's not true. And as we get older, we understand that for the most part, most of us do anyway. But for a 16-year-old girl, what sort of chance did she have? What sort of chance did Virginia have to to fight off these predators? No chance at all, folks. Zero chance at all. And I think that's what's so angering for me. I think the fact that she was preyed upon by such so-called affluent people in these places like Mar-a-Lago, where all of these people congregate, it just, it adds to the, 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 I want to punch someone in the face factor for me. The women showed an interest in the book Virginia was reading, on massage therapy as it happened, and wasted no time telling her that she could get her a job with a billionaire friend who owned a house just around the corner. Virginia's reaction was disarmingly honest, telling the well-spoken stranger that she knew little about massage and was merely interested to learn about it as a potential career. That didn't matter, said the woman. She and the billionaire friend would teach Virginia anything she needed to know. I'm Ghislaine. See you tonight, she added, handing over an address written on an envelope. This is some shit right out of a movie. This is like right out of a movie on TV, a spy novel or one of these novels where they're grooming these girls to be part of a cult. It's 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 chillingly similar to something like that. And how it went on for so long with with it was happening brazenly, folks, and for people to act like they have no idea what was going on for all of the people from Trump on down to Clinton, for all of them to act like they had no idea. I find that very, very hard to believe. Okay, I find it very hard to believe. This, of course, was Ghislaine Maxwell, daughter of disgraced media tycoon Robert Maxwell, amongst many other hats that the man wore. Virginia's head was spinning. A girl from a family where money had always been a struggle was really about to start working for a billionaire? And look, I understand. I come from the inner city. Thankfully, I was never, you know, uh, you know, my parents, my, my dad always hustled. And besides when I was really, really, really young, you know, my dad always had a pretty adequate job where we weren't missing meals or anything like that. But we lived in the inner city my whole entire life, you know, forever, right? And I saw broken homes and I saw it with my own eyes. I saw poverty, true poverty, people that kids that didn't even have meals in some cases. So I understand and I can totally empathize with Virginia when she's, you know, what, what, what they're talking about here about coming from a home where, you know, the opportunities might not be there in abundance for you to go after. And you have to work extra hard maybe to chase down those opportunities. And I saw it time and time again growing up with my own eyes. So I have no doubt that Virginia was fired up to have an opportunity to go work with a billionaire. Can you imagine coming from a a background where you never had much and all of a sudden this lady shows up with this Oxford education, this fancy English accent, and now all of a sudden you're going to be working for a billionaire? Talk about getting the grooming process going right away, getting it going with, you know, all, all steam ahead because that's what was going on. I mean, right from the beginning, you dangle that out there, forget it. You have the hook now. The hook is in. She ran to her father excited, 
Someone thought she was important. This was her chance, and she could not let it slip. For Virginia, as I was to learn when I became her lawyer, had endured a difficult childhood. As a teenager, her parents had put her in a home for troubled girls, but she ran away to Miami. There, she had been groomed by a man almost 50 years her senior who was running a prostitution racket. And this is the kind of shit that we see with all of these girls, folks. And we see it over and over again. And these were the kind of girls that Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell were notorious for going after because the grooming process was not as extensive. They already had been through some trauma. It was easier to get them on the hook and get things moving in the direction that you wanted them to move. After, in, after a brief involvement with the police, her parents rescued her and got her the job at Mar-a-Lago. I first met Virginia a decade after her initial encounter with Maxwell and a year after taking on the case of a 20-year-old Courtney Wilde who had been sexually assaulted by Jeffrey Epstein. It's just, it's so maddening. And, you know, we don't talk about Courtney as much on the show because she's not, they don't write about her as much, but her story matters just as much as the rest of these girls. Every single one of these survivors who has come forward, their story matters just as much as the next story, because it's all of their stories together that gives this such power, that shows us the scope of what these people were truly up to, of what these people were capable of, and the lengths that they would go to make sure that they were protected, and to make sure that their operation it had no hiccups in it. And, you know, it's uh, it's very powerful when all of these girls come forward together like this and they stand shoulder to shoulder like we've seen them and they have one message and it's one message that comes from all of them at the same time. And that message is enough is enough. Having, having listened to Courtney's testimony, my blood pressure rose. This man needed to be stopped. I understand that. Every single one of these articles, my blood pressure rises. At first, the case sounded easy. It was anything but. Over the course of 11 years, the investigation took me all over the United States and beyond. Virginia Roberts, I discovered, was one of countless young girls involved with Epstein and had begun a civil lawsuit against him. She had been to his house in New York, one of the largest townhouses in Manhattan, his ranch in New Mexico, which had its own airplay runway, Fact, his apartment in Paris, and his private island in the U.S. Virgin Islands, Little St. James, which was nicknamed Little St. Jeff's. She had traveled the world with Epstein and was a true insider with detailed knowledge of the structure of his organization. And that's coming from Brad Edwards, right? Bradley Edwards himself. Remember, folks, that's who we're listening to here. This isn't a, a journalist that is reporting on it. This isn't a paper that's reporting on it. This is directly from Bradley Edwards, who has been working on this case for a very very long time and who has intimate knowledge of not only the Jeffrey Epstein organization, but the whole entire case as one, right? As, as a whole going, you know, spanning the, the years. This is a man with intimate knowledge of all of it. And when somebody like this is offering some context, when somebody like this is offering us information, when somebody like this is going to write a book about this, I definitely suggest we listen because it's very important to listen to the people who were really involved, who were on the ground. She held the key to to building a high uh, excuse me she held the key to building a watertight case against him and putting him where he belonged behind bars I found Virginia to be a powerful woman who would not scare easily or be bullied by anyone and we see that daily with Virginia with the way she comes forward and the way she is outspoken and the way she is demanding justice at this point and she has led the way with that on social media for sure. She has been at the forefront from the very beginning on social media and she has been standing up to these people and telling them that she will not be bullied. She will not be scared into silence. And the same goes for the rest of these survivors. The same certainly goes for Maria and Annie Farmer. They're certainly not going to be bullied by these people anymore. Definitely not. 
I certainly won't stand by and, and, and sit by and see it happen, that's for sure. You can guarantee that I'll be eviscerating anyone who is involved in any sort of bullying to these ladies. In fact, any of, any of the survivors of Jeffrey Epstein that I'm in contact with, if they want to send me emails of people bullying them, we'll put them on blast right here on the podcast, and you know we'll let people know what sort of true scumbags are lurking around on social media, or that are working as shills for Ghislaine Maxwell, or the remnants of Jeffrey Epstein's organization organization because they're there. There's there's no doubt that Ghislaine Maxwell is still savvy and you can put nothing by her. So I would, you know, I know for a fact, for a fact that these survivors, some of them for sure, still get harassing emails from people that are involved with Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell. That's 100% factual. So I, I'd, I'll put them right on blast. Anybody even wants to send them anon- anonymously or whatever, I'll put them on blast because people like that are so disgusting, so despicable. Anybody carrying water for someone like Elaine Maxwell or Jeffrey Epstein or anyone involved in this whole sick, sordid affair is really somebody who is deserving of reproach and scorn because it's it's disgusting the behavior is disgusting and anybody who has who is not speaking out against it is enabling it at this point she recounted how her father had driven her that evening in 1999 to epstein's palatial palm beach mansion at el brio way imagine her poor father too again her father doesn't think this is going to occur, right? Her dad's not sitting around thinking this rich guy who's hanging out at Donald Trump's club is going to assault and abuse his daughter. He's thinking, hey, this might be my daughter's shot. This billionaire came and recruited her. I'm going to bring her here. I'm going to support her and we're going to see what's up. And then afterwards for her father to have to reconcile with what really occurred, I can't even imagine being in his shoes. I cannot even imagine being in his shoes. Too naive to be scared, Virginia hopped out of the car and went to the front door, boiling with excitement, ready to learn. She was pinching herself to remember that this wasn't just a dream. Jeffrey has been waiting to meet you, said Maxwell, as she greeted her at the door before heading up the stairs. Follow me. Virginia was taken to a bedroom where Maxwell instructed her on every aspect of how to perform a massage, from the location and placement of the oils to the length of time she would need to spend on each portion of the body. Now, mind you, this is a girl who was working as a towel girl, okay? She was working in the change room, the towel room. She was reading a book about massage. She wasn't a masseuse. She wasn't a professional massage therapist. She was a little girl. And Ghislaine Maxwell said, oh, don't worry about that. We'll teach you how to be a massage therapist. We'll teach you how to be a masseuse. And instead, she shows up to this nasty-ass bastard of a pervert getting naked and having Ghislaine Maxwell direct her in how to go about giving this sick pervert a massage. And this man only got 13 months in jail? All of his co-conspirators are part of that immunity deal? If this doesn't enrage you, if this doesn't make you absolutely insanely mad, I honestly don't know what will. Because this is just uh, abhorrent. It is abhorrent and it is disgusting to read. And it makes me feel like I should drench myself in bleach after I read this. Virginia was taken to a bedroom where Maxwell instructed her on every aspect on how to perform a massage from the location the location and placement of the oils to the length of time she would need to spend on each portion of the body. Then standing by the massage table, Virginia turned to look and saw an older man walking in her direction wearing only a towel and a big childish grin. I'm Jeffrey, he said, before lying down. Oh, can you imagine this gross son of a bitch showing up in the towel? That stupid ass, weird looking long face of his? Oh, there, I'm Jeffrey. I'm here for my massage. What a sick, disgusting bastard. And what a deviously disgusting, wretched woman Ghislaine Maxwell is for assisting in any of this. And for her to still be in hiding and speaking, so called through her mouthpiece, Laura Goldman and nobody being able to track her down, and nobody chasing her down, and nobody dragging her out of her hidey hole and arresting her, is just, it's its unbelievable to me. I honestly cannot believe that it hasn't occurred yet. And maybe after people read this, maybe we should send this to Mr. Berman. Maybe post this on their Facebook page, or let them read the account from Mr. Uh, Edwards, and the, the all the evidence that Mr. Edwards has here. How much more evidence is needed for Berman to stop dragging his feet?
Can we see some action here, sir, or are you just going to continue to piddle around? Maxwell and Jeffrey seemed almost giddy while asking Virginia questions about her life and her future, intersped with Maxwell's instructions on how to give a proper massage. You know, that's it. Butter her up, get her some, give her, ask her some questions, make her feel comfortable, make her feel like everything's all right. Make her feel like this is in an environment where she can be safe, where she can thrive. These are just a few questions. Oh, and by the way, touch Jeffrey right here. And you can see how it develops and how he would procure them. And it's so gross to imagine. It's so gross to envision. The older woman wasted little time before stripping off all of her clothes and telling Virginia to do the same. Epstein, Epstein then sexually assaulted Virginia. Doesn't that feel good, he asked. I, I just, folks, it's just, I, I know I keep saying it, but it, it grosses me out reading this. It's uncomfortable as hell. I hate having to read this. I hate having to report on something like this. It just goes against all good sensibilities of all good people. And it's really... It's depressing to read stuff like that. It's heartbreaking, but we have to understand what occurred and we have to understand why justice is needed so much in this case. And we have to understand why we all have to stand shoulder to shoulder with Virginia Roberts and the rest of these survivors as they chase justice, because while it affects them more than the rest of us, it's a big deal to the rest of us as well, because the whole entire justice system is rocked by this. Never mind all the other bullshit involved with our justice system. When you look at this and you, you look at this in context and you see it for what it is and you see how horrible it is, there is no way that you or I could receive equal justice. Zero chance. And what this does is it shoots a microscope on it. And it, it, you know, these girls, if they weren't, if they weren't so brave to come forward and weather the storm the way they have, then this would never be happening right now. We'd never be shining a light on this corruption and we'd never be seeing the movement that we're seeing in this case. So again, it all, it's a revolving door and it all goes back to the bravery, starting with Maria Farmer when she first outed these people and Annie Farmer, and then all the way up to Virginia who took the, you know, she took the baton and she really went charging hard into the social media era and she harnessed it to, to really help her engage in her search and her battle for justice and that's exactly where we are right now and after reading paragraphs like the one i just read if you're not ready to stand shoulder to shoulder with these survivors and you're not ready to demand justice then i honestly don't don't know what to say to you i don't know what will move you if this doesn't do it she wasn't sure what to think and definitely wasn't sure what to say Yet such was Maxwell's confidence that Virginia simply assumed this was the way massages were performed in the world of the rich and famous, that she should, in other words, get with the program or get another job. And that is always the threat, right? Especially at first. And Virginia, on her part, you know, she's, the way I see it anyway, I don't want to speak for her, obviously, but the way I see it is, you know, she's at this place She's thinking that she's going to be taught how to be a massage, a pretty lucrative career, right? You get yourself a job as a masseuse or a massage therapist, and you're working with the rich and famous, and if Epstein was on the up and up and Maxwell was on the up and up, they could open serious doors for somebody that's looking to become a massage, especially if they're used as referrals, right? So in Virginia's mind, from the way I see it, she's saying to herself, well, yeah, this is, this is our, all right, well, cool. And then all this other stuff starts to happen. The assault starts to happen and she doesn't know what to think. She's like, holy shit, is this the way these people conduct themselves? Is, is, this how, is this normal for the rich and famous? And of course, being a young girl, she's naive and that's what they were looking for. So again, as we read this, you see the grooming process accelerate right before our eyes. You did great. He really loved you, Maxwell told Virginia afterwards. Can you come back tomorrow? Of course, Virginia responded, but her mind was still whirling and she spent the rest of the night crying in the bathroom of her parents' house. Heartbreaking again to imagine, to think, what if it was your sister, your mom, your wife, your daughter that was crying in the bathroom after being assaulted by these sick, depraved, who knows what else kind of perverts over here at El Brio Way and to know that these people 
were protected by the most powerful people, not only in America, but intercontinentally, folks. Think about that for a minute. Just let that stew for a minute. What had just happened? Was everyone like this guy? Yet she also knew that Epstein had just paid her more money than she had been paid in her entire life for no more than an hour of her time. By the time she was 17, Virginia was traveling around with this billionaire and Maxwell, part of what Virginia called their dysfunctional family. She was interacting mostly as a sex abuse victim with powerful people. If she wasn't servicing Epstein, Virginia was being made to please one of his friends. Oh, God. And again, this is why I'm so adamant about the estate paying full funds to these survivors. No money for Denise George. Certainly no money to Ghislaine Maxwell. This is, this is a culminate, this is this, this has been a culmination of months and months and months of reading these articles. And it's just, it's sickening. It gets to a point where it's just so disturbing to try and wrap your mind around what was going on within this criminal enterprise and with Jeffrey Epstein and Ghislaine Maxwell with the way they were grooming these girls. It's so hard for a normal person to wrap their mind around that. And every time we read these articles, I get more and more disgusted and more and more disturbed. And I want justice even more, if that's even possible, after each one of these articles. And it just motivates me to keep going. We're, what Today's 166 straight days, 167 straight days of this podcast. And I'm going to go for 166 more. All right. And then 166 more after that until we get some justice. That's how pissed off I am about all of this. That's how disturbing it is that our justice system can let this go on, could let this happen for decades and never take action against these people. Maxwell called Epstein's girls her children, referring to herself as Mother Hen. She was the one who's, who she was the one who knew what Epstein liked. She seemed vital to Epstein's survival, as another of his victims, Johanna, told me. He needed to have three orgasms a day. It was biological, like eating. Epstein had a particular type of girl. The younger, the better. White, no tattoos, no piercings, no pregnancies. The girls had to look pure. Once Courtney Wilde brought an African-American girl to Epstein's house. He took Courtney inside and left the other girl outside. He handed Courtney $200 and said, do not ever do that again. And I can confirm that. I'm not going to say who told me that Epstein and his whole crew were racists, but I have it on good authority that they were super racist. They were super racist. And they always had comments like that. Always had racist comments about other people, people that weren't like them. And I have it on definite good authority from a source I definitely consider ironclad and trustworthy that that is definitely the case. And seeing Bradley Edwards talk about that here, it just confirms everything that I already know. And I love when that happens. I love when I have two or three sources because what that does is it makes everything ironclad. And that's what I look for here on the podcast. I try and stick with stuff that there's a, an abundance of evidence that points to a certain direction, right? And we stick with that. And if, as long as we do that, as long as we keep reporting these cases every single, I mean, these articles every single day, and we follow the case on a daily basis, we're able to do that because we keep everything in context and nothing slips by us. They can't slide something in on a Friday news cycle like they tried to last night. They can't get something by us on a Saturday. Even in the middle of a worldwide pandemic, we're here right here talking about the Jeffrey Epstein case, at least an hour a day, it seems like now, at the very least an hour a day almost. And it's going to keep going. We're going to keep talking about it and we're going to keep wondering where are the authorities, where is the justice, and why isn't more of this sort of inside information getting out? Because if you, if these people were talking like this, you know all of their buddies were of like mind, right? They were all talking the same way about people they felt that were below them. Oh, how dare you bring an African-American girl here? Really? In the year 2020, that's where we're at? That's the sort of shit we're dealing with? Even in the year 1998 or whatever the year was when Courtney did that? It shouldn't matter. But these are the type of people we're dealing with, folks. 
the type of evil, disgusting, disturbed individuals that are festering at the highest levels of power throughout our own nation and elsewhere. And these are the people we're going to rely on during this pandemic to take care of us? Yeah, I don't feel too confident, folks. Maxwell taught Virginia all the skills she needed to keep him happy. Those included how to act in front of important and powerful people, how to dress, how to hold her knife and her fork, and, of course, how to please him and his friends sexually. And we keep, see, we keep hearing that. That's the theme throughout this uh, article that Mr. Edwards has, has, has penned here. We keep hearing about friends. And we know Virginia has gone on record about a lot of these guys, the Glenn Dubins, Alan Dershowitz, uh, Prince Andrew, uh, et cetera, et cetera. Bill Richardson, uh, George Mitchell. And we know that she's went on record with a lot of these names. But I think that it's almost time for scorched earth. I think that all of these names need to be put out. And Preska, Judge Preska, I highly doubt you're listening to my podcast, but if anyone that knows Judge Preska is, any of her clerks maybe, or, you know, anyone that's close to her, look, the, we implore you to do the right thing here. The people demand answers, and they demand some transparency from somewhere. We have gotten zero transparency from any organization that is supposedly representing the interests of the American people. And it is un it's unacceptable. It is unacceptable. And we're not going to let it slide. I'm certainly not going to let it slide. Maxwell, an elegant figure whose social circle included not just leading business figures, but members of the royal family, was, one, was the one woman who Epstein appeared to treat as an equal. She was a chameleon, blending in with high and low society as it suited. Of course she, he treated her as an equal. She was the boss behind the scenes, El Patroni, right? She's the acting boss, he's the street boss, he takes the heat. Maxwell's the trained spy, in my opinion. She was the one that grew up with Bob, with Bob Maxwell, Mr. Spy himself, for several different alphabet organizations. That's the court she grew up in. She was the one with the brains in the operation. She was the one coming up with the ideas. She was the one involved in the grooming. Epstein was just the man that was, was the face of the whole entire thing. He was the man that was inserted to wrangle around with Les Wexner. The man inserted to get some money from his buddy Jess Staley. The man inserted to talk with Glenn Dubin and hang with Glenn Dubin. That's Ep that was Epstein's role. Ghislaine Maxwell was the brains behind this whole operation. And we're hearing Edward say that right here. He treated her as an equal. She was a chameleon. We know all of this stuff, but we have confirmation. What it does, folks, tells all of you out there who knew all of this stuff, even before you found this podcast, you were putting two and two together on your own. It shows you you're on the right track. You're not crazy. You're not conspiracy theorists. You're people who are demanding answers and people who want transparency. This has long been far away from a conspiracy. We've moved on from a conspiracy a long time ago in this case, especially on this podcast. We've moved on to the cover-up. And we've been covering the cover-up for quite some time. And it just goes to show that that's exactly what's going on here. The most seemingly outrageous claim that Virginia made during our interview was that she was taken by Epstein and Maxwell to London, where she was lent out to Prince Andrew, the Duke of York, a.k.a. the Prince of Lies, a.k.a. the Prince of Punk Asses. During my first conversation with Virginia, I asked her to provide proof of some of her allegations. She sent me the envelope that Maxwell had given her when they first met with directions to Epstein's address as well as, a tra as travel and hotel receipts charged to Epstein's card. Those are little, little, literal receipts, folks. You know when we talk about, all right, let's see some receipts, let's see some proof. Those are little, literal receipts proving what Virginia Roberts had to say. Meanwhile, all we have is BS from Prince Andrew, BS from Epstein, BS from Maxwell, BS from the core four, BS from the whole entire lot of them. Meanwhile, Virginia Roberts over here flipping out all sorts of proof, pictures, envelopes, actual receipts, corroborated statements by pilots. Come on, man. Not enough evidence. Not long afterwards, Virginia showed me a photograph of herself age 17 
wedged in between Maxwell and Andrew. She said it was taken by Epstein in Maxwell's apartment in London in 2001. Of all the people she claimed to have been introduced to and made to have sex with, the Duke of York sounded the most preposterous. Yet here was a picture of the two of them, arm in arm, smiling like a happy pair out for the night, even though he's 23 years her senior. And without this picture, nobody would have ever believed Virginia Roberts about this. Nobody would have ever believed her. And it is just, it's amazing to me that she has all these receipts and that she has this picture and she has all of this proof. It was further confirmation of an extraordinary sex abuse enterprise that I was discovering went far beyond what was uncovered in Florida. I knew that Epstein was addicted to sex with children and had assistants scheduling multiple appointments per day with different girls, Nadia Marcinkova, Leslie Groff, Adriana Ross, Sarah Kellen Vickers, The Core Four. He traveled all the time, all over the world, with the same assistants who clearly knew what he was up to. While there had not been any evidence of Prince Andrew spending time at Epstein's Palm Beach house while young girls were upstairs with Epstein, witnesses had confirmed that the billionaire, pedophile, and the prince were close friends. Next, I obtained evidence of at least one more encounter between Andrew and Epstein. Another of his victims, Johanna said she vividly remembered seeing Andrew at Epstein's New York mansion. She described how Virginia was sitting on one of Andrew's knees and Johanna herself was sitting on the other. While the two girls were in his lap, Ghislaine Maxwell took out a puppet figure of Andrew and placed the puppet's hand on Virginia's breast, at which point Andrew placed his hand on Johanna's breast. Everyone laughed. Pursuing Epstein on behalf of his victims became my life mission. Uh, this is just the sort of behavior that we come to expect from these people at this point. Prince Andrew was involved in all of it. How many people do we have to hear now from that say he was groping Virginia or he was touching Virginia or he was kissing Virginia? We have the picture. We have the lies. We have the whole entire trail of breadcrumbs leading up to the fact that Prince Andrew is guilty as all hell. He was an intellectually gifted sociopath with unlimited wealth who lived a virtually unconstrained life. The rules he and those in his fold lived by were his own. The problem was that his rules didn't account for laws. Here we go, folks, the two-tiered justice system. Aren't I always crowing about it? I'm sure a lot of you are tired of hearing me talk about it, but it's such a prevalent problem here in the United States especially. It is just so gross the way justice and the miscarriage of that justice is handled at so many different levels, but here especially. Epstein had amassed, had amassed extensive political and worldly connections. For decades, he used his tremendous fortune to sexually exploit women and girls, some as young as 14. Our team was working hard to stay focused on what mattered to secure a conviction. Virginia had important revelations that should not be silenced. 100%. 100%. And the fact that she, no media was ever, ste no media stepped forward to really listen to what Virginia had to say or to give her a platform just goes to prove that they didn't care. We saw it with Annie and Marie Farmer, and we saw it with Virginia, and we saw it with the rest of these girls. Up until very recently, remember, folks, always remember and keep it at the forefront of your mind. The legacy media never gave a goddamn about these gals until recently. While Epstein and his entourage were looking to shut her down, she was determined to be heard. Because Virginia liked Amy Robach of the ABC Network, we chose her, and we flew with Virginia to New York in April 2015 for the taping of an interview in which she would sit down her full story. The interview was powerful. In fact, we were told it was one of the best interviews anyone had seen and would air on Good Morning America. The Epstein organization was finally going to be exposed. 
but after being strung along for weeks, we were told that because Virginia talked about her interactions with Prince Andrew, the network had to seek comment from the royal family and from an attorney for Epstein since nearly the entire story discussed the inner workings of his sex trafficking organization. So basically, ABC has such little integrity, folks, that they had to run this story by their handlers in Jeffrey Epstein's organization and the royals. Can you imagine? I have news for you. I wouldn't run shit by either of them. They don't, they don't deserve anything. They don't deserve anything ran by them at this point. Why? So they can lie or give some stupid non-committal statement, some canned ass statement? Sorry. For some reason, both presented a problem for ABC. We were not told much other than the network was scared it could lose access to the royal family if it aired the interview. And don't forget, Georgie Stepanopoulos works for them. He's their hotshot. They wanted to protect their buddy George, who was palling around with Epstein after his conviction. I'll never let you forget that, folks. I will continue to drive that home because that pompous little bastard George Stepanopoulos makes me ill. For whatever reason, the interview never made it on screen, which deeply frustrated Amy Robach. More than four years later, after Epstein's sexual abuse was widely reported, Amy expressed her frustration. I've had the story for three years. I've had this interview with Virginia Roberts. We would not put it on the air. I was told the palace found out that her that he had her whole allegation about Prince Andrew and threatened us in a million different ways. We were so afraid we wouldn't be able to interview Kate and Prince Will that that also quashed the story. Can you imagine what planet, what sort of warped ass planet does ABC live on where they think they can kill stories so they can keep their access to some dumbass royals? No offense to my English listeners, I'm sorry, but these royals mean nothing to me, okay? They mean nothing to me. And for ABC to quash a story as important as this, to step on this story... Because they didn't want to lose access to the royals, it is obscene, and there should be con- consequences for them. ABC should be so, there, there should be consequences for such piss poor work. They enabled what occurred. They basically were enabling what occurred. If they would have put this story on in 2015 when they first had it, how many girls would have not been assaulted by Epstein? Would he have been arrested right after the story aired? Possibly. They sure went after him after the Miami Herald and Julie Brown went to work on him. What's to say that this interview wouldn't have predi- wouldn't have uh, sprung the, the feds into action? So ABC has a big problem here, all right? They're enablers, they have egg on their face, and the fact that they're a Disney subsidiary is, is even grosser. Disney needs to sell ABC News off ASAP. While Virginia Roberts was traveling the world with Epstein and Maxwell, she had a boyfriend, one much closer in age, called Tony. He didn't ask many questions, even though he knew what was going on. Virginia had told him, for example, that she didn't wish to sleep with Prince Andrew, but that it was necessary if they were to maintain their lifestyle. There came a time, however, when life inside Epstein's debauched world became too much for even a strong soul such as her. At age 19, when she had been involved in the sex cult for over two years, wow, that's, that's, that's awesome that he called it a sex cult. I've been saying that from the beginning. I haven't had, heard anybody else talk about this, how much it's like Nexium, and we all know that that was a huge, big-time sex cult. And that's what this was as well. As, amongst other things, it was also a sex cult. Epstein and Maxwell came up with a proposal that turned her stomach. They wanted her to carry his baby. They told Virginia she would be taken care of for the rest of her life and if she would agree to give Epstein and Maxwell a child, although there were some strings attached. In particular, she would have to sign a contract agreeing that the baby was not her own, but the legal child of Epstein and Maxwell. It was the final straw. She couldn't bear the thought of Epstein and Maxwell raising her child. She knew she had to escape. And we know that this is factual as well because we saw what Epstein was up to at the Zorro Ranch and what his plans were for the Zorro Ranch. We know he wanted to seed the Zorro Ranch. I use it as a place to seed the world with his offspring. And we just see that here at an earlier stage, at a different stage, where he wants to use Virginia as a surrogate. Her chance came during a trip to Thailand. 
At Epstein's direction, Virginia had been dispatched there to pick up a young girl, interview her, and let Epstein know if she was qualified. But rather than meet the girl, Virginia recognized her chance to escape. She went into town and met a man from Australia who fell in love with her and promised to take care of her. She married him days later, hopped on a plane with him to Australia, and never looked back. She hid in Australia for nearly 10 years, during which time she had three children. Over 11 years, I represented more than 30 victims in lawsuits and claims against Epstein, and in the end, justice was finally served. He was arrested. But he convinced a psychologist to let him off suicide watch. Of course he did. He could convince anyone of anything. He was the most notorious child molester on the planet. I've been saying that as well. There is so much more we don't know. So many unnamed girls that this guy molested. So many girls who are girl A or girl B, but they have no names or faces to go with the trauma that they suffered. And it breaks my heart to, to report that. It breaks my heart to know that. And I truly hope that wherever these girls are out there, if they're still out there, wherever it may be, whatever the situa situation is, I just hope that they find a little bit of peace of mind at some point in their lives. He had fallen overnight from a jet-setting billionaire who controlled everyone around him to a caged animal at the mercy of prison guards and inmates. All signs indicated a high risk for suicide. A month later, he was found hanging in his, skull, in his cell. He'd escaped responsibility once again. Even though he died, the story of Jeffrey Epstein's crimes should not. I owe it to the brave women such as Virginia Roberts who came forward to seek justice to share what really happened. Copyright Bradley J. Edwards, 2020. Now remember, he his book comes out on uh, March 31st and the book is called Relentless Pursuit it's entitled Relentless Pursuit, and it comes out March 31st. I just pre-ordered it on Audible, and if you have any credits or you're looking for something to spend a credit on, or if you're not a member of Audible, this is not an ad for them, by the way. I'm not affiliated with them in any manner, but any sort of audio book station that you use, audio book uh, source that you use, uh, I, would, I would download this book or buy it from Barnes & Noble and read it, whatever it may be, but I am sure it's going to be fill, filled with really, really good information. And we're going to continue to read these blurbs that uh, Bradley has here leading up to the release of the book. So, folks, it's heating up for these people. More information is trickling out. More information comes out by the day. And we're seeing a lot of movement here. And we're going to keep seeing a lot of movement here. And it might come in increments and it might come in inches and it might come in, you know, there might be days where it comes in yards. But as long as we're moving in the right direction and we're continuing to cover this case and there's in, the interest continues to build in this case and the interest continues to build really in the pursuit of justice, well, we know that we're on the right path. And seeing Bradley Edwards come out and release this information and give it to us from the, you know, proverbial horse's mouth is very important. And it goes a long way to show everybody that we're on the right track. And I think that's the most important thing. None of us want to spin, spin our wheels, right? None of us want to waste our time. None of us want information that isn't useful or in a, in a, information that isn't educational in regards to the case. And, you know, that's what we try. Well, that's what I strive to do here. I strive to, I, I strive to make sure that we have the most pertinent information in regards to this case. And I don't have all the answers. I've said that a million times here on this podcast. I, you know, I get emails from listeners all the time and I learn from you folks just as much as I'm sure you're learning from me. So it's definitely a symbiotic relationship, and I, I'm very happy that so many of you reach out to me via email and on Twitter, and I really enjoy interacting with all of you, and I think it really helps educate all of us when we're interacting the way we do uh, in regards to this case. So tomorrow, 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 I will be premiering my podcast that's dealing with the COVID-19 pandemic. And tomorrow's daily drop here on the Jeffrey Epstein Show will contain information on where to find the new podcast. 
So the podcast, I'll be releasing it tomorrow evening. And I'll give you the exact time tomorrow on the drop. I'm still working out a few particulars about what time I want to uh, I want to drop it. But expect it tomorrow, and the information will be given to you uh, as far as the link, etc., cetera, etc., cetera, where you can find it. You know how you can listen, all of that good stuff. That'll all be provided tomorrow in the daily drop. I mean, excuse me, in the morning update. So you'll be able to find that in the description box of the morning update tomorrow. And what we're going to do is we're going to start at the very beginning. We're going to start at how the outbreak started, where it started supposedly. We're going to look at a couple of different theories on what's going on at, you know, ground zero, Wuhan, where it originated. We're going to talk and we're going to work our way out from there. And we're going to read a bunch of different articles the same way we do here on the Jeffrey Epstein show. We're going to use the same format as the Daily Drop. And we're going to read these articles and we're going to educate ourselves together. And we're going to find out what's BS. We're going to find out what's the truth, hopefully. And again, just like with the Jeffrey Epstein show, I'm certainly not an epidemiologist or or a virologist. It is a topic that I'm very interested in. It, 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 it's a topic that I do have uh, a lot of history as in reading books about because it's something that interests me, but I'm certainly not, you know, the, the be all, uh, information, uh, spigot that knows everything about the case. I mean, about the, uh, the situation and I'm not going to sit here and make pretend I am. So if you have articles that you think are interesting or that you think will be, um, educational to everybody else in regards to the, the COVID-19 situation, definitely send those to me as well. So be on the lookout for all of that tomorrow. Be expecting that. That's the format that you can expect. And you can expect the same thing that I do here, folks. The no bullshit approach. We're going to try and cut to the chase. We're going to cut through the fat. And we're going to get to what's important. So if you would like to contact me, you can do that at bobbycapucci at protonmail.com. That's B-O-B-B-Y-C-A-P-U-C-C-I at protonmail.com. And you can also find me on Twitter at B-O-B-B-Y underscore C-A-P-U-C-C-I. All right, everybody. I hope you all have as good of a Saturday night as possible. And I will be back tomorrow with the morning update the premiere of the new COVID-19 coronavirus podcast, and of course, the daily drop in the evening. And then look for episode three of our Core 4 series on Monday. You see, I told you that your boy had you covered since everyone's basically quarantined in their house, right? I figure I'll pump out some content. I'll get you folks all fired up. We can, you know, you listen to some podcasts. I'm doing the same thing. And, you know, it'll provide you with at least a little bit of an escape for a little while. And, you know, if I can do that, my little bit, my little part to help entertain you folks, then, hey, that's what I'm going to do. But expect all of that in the next couple of days. And... Yeah, I hope everybody has as good of a Saturday night as possible, and I will talk to everybody in the morning.